Thanks, Joel, for the introduction. It's great to be here this morning. And I, I'm going to focus in a little bit on that first bucket that Scott mentioned in the systematic review world with some of the things that we do at the Evidence-Based Practice Center in evidence synthesis. And within that, I'm going to focus on indirect comparisons. So I won't reiterate the definition of comparative effectiveness research. I think we heard, we heard um, a really nice definition of that from Scott. But what I want to do is say that we do a lot of comparative drug effectiveness reviews. And in those, we utilize a number of methods to compare different drugs to figure out what's best. We'd like to have head-to-head -head trials when we're making those comparisons, but we often don't. There's often no direct evidence between the things that we're interested in comparing. So the best evidence available is often indirect evidence. Uh, and there's a variety of methods that we can use to take that indirect evidence and try to answer the questions um, that we're trying to answer. But there's relatively little information about how these various methods compare with each other and how they compare with direct evidence. And that's, that's what I want to focus on this morning. So the question that we're trying to answer when we do a, a systematic review or a comparative effectiveness review is which intervention has the greatest probability <clears throat> of being most effective or which has the greatest probability of being least harmful or most effective and least harmful. And the question is, how do we best answer that question? So standard meta-analyses that we would do in the past would be restricted just to head-to-head -head trials. And so if we wanted to know how drug A compares with drug B, we would only look at trials that compare drug A with drug B. But it's often of interest to compare a number of medications with each other in a setting where there are few or no head-to-head -head studies. Um, so methods such as adjusted indirect comparisons, which I'll say more about in a little bit, and mixed treatment comparisons meta-analysis using Bayesian methods have been proposed when direct evidence is either unavailable or insufficient to answer the questions. So my purpose today is just to give an overview of these various approaches um, for making indirect comparisons. So to say a little bit more about what I mean by an indirect comparison, um, this, this figure illustrates that. So We'd be interested in comparing intervention A or drug A with intervention B or drug B. And there may be zero studies that we find in our systematic review addressing that question. But we may find that there are a number of studies comparing each of those drugs with placebo and a number comparing each of those drugs with another intervention or drug C. And so the question is, what do we do with all this to come up with the best answer we can? And I'll describe four different types of approaches that can be used to make um, indirect comparison. The first of those is qualitative indirect comparisons. Um, this is also sometimes referred to as a narrative approach to indirect comparisons. And I'll use an example here from a report that we've done recently on some of the newer diabetes medications. Uh, this report was done for the Drug Effectiveness Review Project. And so to orient to the forest plot, this is looking at mean improvement in hemoglobin A1C. And it's more important to get the bigger picture than, than the details. I know you probably can't read the fine print, but the line of no difference is right here. Um, and each of the other lines represents a one percentage point decrease in hemoglobin A1C. These particular forest plots are comparing exenatide with placebo and liraglutide with placebo, and it's stratified by dose. So the first grouping is exenatide 10 milligrams grams versus placebo. The second is exenatide, five milligrams versus placebo. And then the next three groupings are the three different dose groupings of liraglutide compared with placebo. Each of the black diamonds represents the pooled point estimate for that drug and dose compared to placebo. And I've pulled those off here down at the bottom, so the five pooled point estimates are, are there together. And so the qualitative approach to an indirect comparison would just be to look at these five pooled point estimates and to say, well, it looks like these three doses here uh, or these liraglutide improvements in A1C are better than these two for the doses of exenatide. So liraglutide is better than exenatide as far as reduction in hemoglobin A1C. And this happens all the time. People take studies from the literature and they pull one that's versus placebo and they just look at the, the between group difference and they take those of another drug and they look at the between group difference and they say, well, it looks like this one's better than the other one. And I should say there are two general ways people can do this. One is just to look at the point estimate 
And the other is to also look at the confidence intervals. So if the confidence intervals overlap, then we would say, well, there's not actually a statistically significant difference to make a little bit of an indirect leap here between the two treatments. So we might say that, well, for 10 milligrams of exenatide, this confidence interval actually overlaps with the confidence interval for all the doses of liraglutide. So maybe there's not a difference between those. But for the 5 milligram dose, um, they don't overlap with the higher doses of liraglutide. So we might conclude that liraglutide is better. In this particular instance, there is some direct evidence to compare that with. So there is one head-to-head -head study of exenatide and liraglutide that had a little over 450 people enrolled. And it found actually what you would expect. It would have found from looking at that indirect evidence. So the two happen to be consistent in this particular case, where liraglutide was better than exenatide. And the point estimate was very similar to that from the meta-analysis of placebo-controlled studies, where it was a little better than one for liraglutide, and it was uh, about 0.8 for exenatide. So the next method uh, that I was going to mention for indirect comparisons is the unadjust, unadjusted indirect comparisons, or sometimes referred to as naive indirect comparisons. So what I have represented in this figure is two um, bodies of literature. So on the left, these, these are intended to represent a number of studies of drug A versus various comparators. So there's four here that are drug A versus placebo, and then four others that are drug A versus other active control drugs. Then on the right, we've got drug B versus placebo, and there are five studies there of drug B versus placebo, and three others of drug B versus other active controls. The unadjusted indirect comparisons method would just pool the point estimates from the drug A arms of those studies on the left and compare that with pooling the uh, point estimates from the drug B arms of the studies on the right, essentially treating them as if they had come from one large trial and ignoring the comparator group and ignoring the between group difference between drug and comparator. This approach um, has a high rate of discrepancies when it's been compared with direct evidence. Uh, and it's been shown that it produces overly precise estimates, and it's generally not recommended. Moving on to the third method, the adjusted indirect comparisons. Now here I've demonstrated or illustrated the same body of literature. So we've, we've got four studies of drug A versus placebo and five studies of drug B versus placebo. But in, a, in the adjusted indirect comparisons, we're going to utilize just the studies that have a common comparator, in this case, P for placebo. So to do this, it's important to consider heterogeneity, just as we would in, in any meta-analysis, to consider how heterogeneous are the studies that we're considering pooling together. But this goes to another level, because we have to do it not just within one group of head-to-head -head studies that we'd be pooling, but we have to do it on several different levels. So the first is within the group of studies of drug A versus placebo. Are those similar enough where we think it's reasonable to um, pool that data? The next is in the studies of drug B versus placebo. And then finally, across those studies. So is the drug B versus placebo group similar enough to the drug A versus placebo group? And it's important that these populations must be similar for this um, method, in theory, to be valid. Uh, so one strength of this method compared to the last one is that it at least partially um, utilizes the strength of randomization from the original um, randomized controlled trials because it looks at the between group differences rather than just the point estimate from the intervention of interest. An another strength of this is that it can be done with standard software. Um, so it can be done in Stata or SAS, which is different from the next method that I'm about to describe. Uh, another nice thing about this is that you can set up a logistic model or meta regression that allows you to adjust for potential confounding factors. So we might say um, dose or study duration is an important potential confounder when we're comparing the studies of drug A versus drug B, and you can adjust for those factors in the model. The question often comes up about how many studies are needed to do an adjusted indirect comparison. And, and the best answer to that comes from a health technology assessment that was published in 2005, where they said you need four times as many equally sized studies to have the same power as a single direct comparison. So in other words, if you had one head-to-head -head study of 200 people to get the same 
power as that one study, you would need four studies to go into your indirect comparison. And so people have taken that another step and sort of said, well, if you don't have at least four studies of the comparison of interest, you shouldn't be doing an indirect comparison. So how valid are adjusted indirect comparisons? So there is some empiric evidence. And the, the first thing that was published on this to try to take on this question came out in 2003. And they found that the results of adjusted indirect comparisons are usually not significantly different from those of direct comparisons. They did a systematic review of the literature to look at um, cases where both indirect comparisons and direct comparisons had done. And I should say specifically adjusted indirect comparisons had been done, as well as um, direct head-to-head -head comparisons. And just three of the 44 um, that were published that they found found a significant difference between the two. So they concluded, you know, and this was in the, in the setting of adjusted indirect comparisons coming under a lot of scrutiny and sort of being washed aside as not valid, and that's the setting under which they did this, and they concluded that, you know, the majority of the time these actually look like they are valid. But since then, a number of other publications have come out to illustrate um, cases where they, where they differ. So the number of, that are actually different has been increasing since that point in time. The, the health technology assessment that I mentioned that was published in 2005 reported moderate agreement with a cap uh, of about 0.5 between direct and indirect comparisons. And this was from 28 systematic reviews in the database of abstracts and reviews of effectiveness. So the, f the fourth method and the last one that I was going to talk about today is mixed treatment comparisons meta-analysis or network meta-analysis. So, so one thing that's, um, that's really nice about mixed treatment comparisons meta-analysis or network meta-analysis is that you can compare a number of interventions in one analysis. So everything else I've mentioned up to this point, if you, if you have nine treatments you're interested in comparing, you actually have to do a whole bunch of separate analyses to make those comparisons. So you have to do a separate analysis for drug A versus B and A versus C and A versus D and then B versus C and B and so on. So you end up with this factorial for how many um, calculations and analyses you actually have to do. Whereas with the mixed treatment comparisons meta-analysis, you can put the data from all the studies with common comparators into one analysis to come up with a relative strength of each of those interventions. To do this, um, as opposed to the last method, which can be done using common software that most analysts are familiar with and comfortable with, this requires wind bugs. Um, and so it's done by fitting a, a model using Bayesian inference computed with Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation in wind bugs version 1.4. So there aren't that many analysts who are familiar with wind bugs or who can, can do this analysis. Um, with it, prior probabilities are imputed into this um, if you use Bayesian inference. And generally, all the baseline and inter intervention parameters are given flat priors, meaning that at the outset, we don't assume that any one treatment is more likely to be effective than any other treatment. And there's some debate about whether that's the way that this should be done or if we should actually use some other approach um, for the prior probabilities. <clears throat> also. This runs a, a number of simulations, and most publications that have done this throw away the first 20,000 or so simulations, and then they use the next 40 to 80,000 simulations for the actual results. And in the end, the model provides a distribution of the probabilities for each treatment to be most effective. And then each of the estimated probabilities can be used to calculate an odds ratio of that treatment um, being more effective than each of the other treatments. And so I'll give an example here that shows um, what that might look like. And this is from a report that we're finishing up right now. So I've changed the names of the drugs to protect the innocent. And since this isn't publicly available yet, um, but, but, I, but I can say that these are um, biologic agents, targeted immune modulators. And there are about nine of them that we're looking at for the treatment of a particular condition. And for this um, network, you can see the common comparator here is placebo. The lines don't show up that great, but there's a, a line connecting each intervention with any other intervention where there's a study comparing those. And in this particular network, almost all the studies compare the drugs with placebo. We just have one head-to-head -head study um, in this network. But in general, a network could become much more complicated if there were other common comparators other than placebo or if there were more head-to-head -head studies in this network. 
and, and the numbers next to each one of these lines say how many studies there were comparing that particular intervention with placebo. This is what one of the, one of the outputs that we generate looks like. And the, the primary outcome that we were looking at here was ACR50, which is a 50% improvement in this composite um, American College of Rheumatology score. And you can see here that uh, we've highlighted the ones that were most likely to be effective. And drug number five comes out to have a, about a 60% probability of being effective, and it was the, the highest. And then you have about a 47% probability for the next one, and then a 36% probability. The other columns here, after the first column representing our, our main analysis for our primary outcome, because that's thought to be the most clinically significant outcome, is reaching an ACR50 response. But we also ran it for an ACR20 response, which is 20% response, and ACR70 or 70% response. The three columns on the right are just a few examples of sensitivity analyses that we ran. And I think this is, as with any of these types of analyses, this is really important to run a number of sensitivity analyses because there are assumptions that are built into this model. And so we wanted to explore some of those. Um, and some of the ones that we explored here were, you know, we had one particular drug where there was only one study comparing it with placebo. So we wondered, is, is that enough to still include it in this model, or do you need more than one study? And, and nobody really knows the answer to that question, so we ran it with and without, and it didn't really change the findings. Another thing we looked at was, you know, what background therapies are people on in these various trials? So a lot of people are on background methotrexate in some trials, and they're not in others. So we ran it um, with and without those different groupings of studies. And then finally, study duration is another example I show here. So we um, based on looking at a number of other analyses and talking with clinical experts, we decided to run a sensitivity analysis where we only looked at studies that were a minimum of 24 weeks in duration. This is another output that we generate. It's actually not generated by the, by the software, but you can take the output of the software and generate a forest plot. Um, and, and I've deleted the part on the left that would show the name of each drug versus every other drug. And this is just the, the top of it. This goes on and on and on because it's got nine different drugs and listing of, you know, drug A versus B, A versus C, A versus D, and then the same groupings for drug B versus everything and drug C versus everything. And on the right, um, it shows the odds ratio um, for the odds of that particular drug being more effective than the one that it's compared to, and it gives a 95% credible interval. And those are, the odds ratio and the credible interval are outputs of the, of the program. This is just another example of a network that starts to show, uh, in certain networks, if you had a number of common comparators, that it can, there can be a lot more um, connections to draw, and it can almost need to be three-dimensional, actually, to really demonstrate what's going on with all the different comparisons. Some limitations that I wanted to point out uh, with indirect comparisons and mixed treatment comparisons meta-analysis, and I think these are really important. Whenever we do them, we have, we have quite a, a lengthy s section that really deals with all the disclaimers we feel like we maybe need to make in doing an indirect analysis. But, but the main assumption on which these are based is similarity of populations in these studies. And it's, a, it's an assumption that we can't completely verify. So we can look at certain characteristics of the population, and we can verify that the mean age was similar. Um, we can verify that their baseline disease activity of rheumatoid arthritis or whatever we're looking at was similar. But we can't verify a number of things because we only have limited information about each of the populations. There certainly um, could be important differences between the populations that we don't know about. Uh, another limitation, and I've touched on this a little bit, is that there are examples where the results differ from direct comparisons. And it's not entirely clear when that's more or less likely to happen. So if we had a real, real clarity on when indirect comparisons are likely to match direct comparisons, uh, I think that would increase people's confidence in the use of indirect methods. But right now it's not clear when they match and when they don't. So there are some examples that I've listed here that people have shown are cases where they don't often match up. And those are when there are very few studies in the indirect comparisons analysis, uh, when there are differences in study quality. So if you have um, 
significant flaws in study design and increased risk of bias in one group of studies, then you're likely to not have results that match up. Also, if there are a really low number of events, so if we're looking at a dichotomous outcome or number of events and it's a really low number in total in all this, then there's a good chance our results won't match up. And then finally, when there's obvious heterogeneity um, across those studies, whether it be in the population or the way the interventions were delivered or in the outcomes or the way they were measured um, or in the study duration. Some questions for exploration that we've identified, and we're trying to take on several of these in some methods work that we're starting up right now. Uh, the first question is, how do the results of mixed treatment comparisons meta-analysis compare with adjusted indirect comparisons? So the third and fourth uh, types of approaches that I described, there hasn't been much exploration of how the results of those two things compare with each other. Likewise, there hasn't, there's hardly anything on how the results of mixed treatment comparisons meta-analysis compare with direct comparisons alone. So, so we think we need more evidence to look at at least some case studies or maybe, um, maybe something even beyond that to get more information about when these things are similar and when they're not. Uh, next question we're trying to approach is, can we do a mixed treatment comparisons meta-analysis to determine a relative risk? Right now, everybody who's published one has reported an odds ratio. And there's, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to calculate a relative risk, but for some reason, we haven't been able to get the program to do it um, where something doesn't go wrong. It's not, it looks like nobody else has either yet, so we're trying to figure out why that is. And another big question is what to use for the prior probability. So I mentioned that we used flat priors, and that's sort of been the standard and what others have used as well. But there's, I think there are a lot of questions about whether that's the right thing to do, whether we should be using informed priors or posterior priors, and, and how much of a difference does it really make um, when we're running so many thousand iterations on this program waiting for convergence um, to occur. Uh, another one is related to those iterations and how many of them do we actually need to run. So we're, we're starting to explore some sensitivity analyses. And I know um, one of the trainees has used this as her, her thesis, is trying to figure out you know, how many iterations you need to run and you know, how much of a difference it makes. And then finally, how many studies do we need per spoke in that mixed treatment comparisons meta-analysis? So on the spokes where we just have one study, is it okay to include those or not? And we need more examples where we can run sensitivity analyses to look at it with and without those studies to see how much it changes the various models. And the one that we did, it, it didn't end up making any difference when we um, removed the spoke with one study. And I'll, and I'll end with um, an example, and this actually refers a little bit back to Scott, what you were talking about with the antidepressants report. And this, this was the last iteration of it actually, and the, the newer updated one um, just came out, or maybe it's just about to come out. I'm not sure if it's actually even out yet, but so this is from the last iteration, where the results of the RTI-UNC Evidence-Based Practice Center systematic review that used an adjusted indirect comparisons approach concluded that there were no significant differences in efficacy between antidepressants. But just a little bit after that, another group um, out of Italy used a mixed treatment comparisons meta-analysis model, so different um, analytic approach, and they concluded that escitalopram and sertraline are more effective than other antidepressants. And this is with essentially the same group of studies in the two analyses. Uh, and th this is my last slide, but I, I was told that for people to get um, continuing education, there needed to be uh, multiple choice questions so that, that people can answer so there's an interactive component. So this is the question. <laughs> Which of the following methods is generally not recommended and has a high rate of discrepancies when compared with direct estimates? And then three choices, A, B, and C, unadjusted indirect comparisons, adjusted indirect comparisons, or mixed treatment comparisons. So if you're getting continuing education, I think you're supposed to write down the letter and then turn it in later. And with that, um, I think we have a few minutes for questions.